from the Douglas County Courthouse at 8700 Hospital Drive, this is 8700. Hello everyone, from the Douglas County Courthouse at 8700 Hospital Drive, this is 8700 on DCTV 23, I'm Wes Tallon. And I'm Lena Hardy. Thanks for joining us. SWITCH, a global technology solutions corporation, will create 65 jobs and along with its clients, invest $2.5 billion in a SWITCH Prime data center in Douglas County. The new Lithia Springs location will be the highest rated data center in the southeastern United States. The more than 1 million square foot campus named The Keep will become the fourth SWITCH Prime campus located in the U.S. SWITCH is a technology infrastructure ecosystem corporation whose core business is the design, construction, and operation of the most advanced data centers and most powerful technology ecosystems on the planet. As more people, businesses, governments, and devices come online, the need for data centers increases, as does the growing need to power these data centers with renewable energy. Switch's clients include, among others, eBay, TiVo, Amazon Web Services, Logitech, HP, Intel, Cisco, Hulu, Time Warner Cable, Wells Fargo Bank, and Fox Television. Douglas County is working towards fixed route and demand response bus service to hopefully begin in January 2018. The initial plan is to begin with two routes plus paratransit service. The Federal Transit Administration has money available through its bus and bus related facilities program with which to purchase buses and passenger amenities such as shelters and signage. Douglas County is applying for these funds. The grant will provide almost $484,000 in federal money, with $121,000 local match. Initially, Douglas County wants to start two routes. The county will order four buses, two for the routes, one backup, and a fourth for a desired third route for later in the year. The buses will be small and will contain a driver, 12 ambulatory passengers, and two wheelchair passengers. The preliminary north side route will serve Douglas Jesse Davis Park, Stewart Middle School, Chicago Avenue Apartments, Boys and Girls Club, Hunter Park, Walmart, Home Depot, Georgia Highlands College, Arbor Place Mall, Target, Wellstar Hospital, the Courthouse, and Defects. The pre preliminary central circular will serve downtown Douglasville, the library, health department, Walmart, Arbor Place Mall, Hobby Lobby, West Georgia Technical College, Wellstar Hospital, and the Courthouse. Both routes will intersect at the Multimodal Transportation Center, and the new system will be known as Connect Douglas. A longtime Carroll County educator and elected official will be Douglas County's next school superintendent. Trent North took office June 1st, replacing Dr. Gordon Prince, who retired May 31st after seven years as Douglas County Super School Superintendent and 40 years in education. Mr. North was in his second term as principal of Carrollton Middle School. He served five years as Director of Community Affairs and Program Compliance in the Carrollton City School System and 19 years in various other positions, including the classroom in the Carrollton System. He also was serving his sixth consecutive term on the Carroll County Board of Commissioners, a position that he resigned to become Douglas County School Superintendent. He earned his bachelor's degree in political science from the University of West Georgia, a master's degree in educational leadership from West Georgia, and an education specialist degree from Lincoln Memorial University. The Douglas County School District has 26,000 students, 35 schools, a budget of $219 million and 3,000 employees. School is out, but there's always something to learn. Find out what creative classes and workshops you can take throughout the summer break next up on Newsmakers. So please stay with me. I'm Lena Hardy. And I'm Wes Talon, and this is 8700 on DCTV 23. <laughs> The 
mission of the Cultural Arts Council of Douglas County is to lead our community in an active and innovative arts environment. To accomplish this goal, the Council offers several programs and activities. Its Executive Director, Davina Grace Hill, joins me to tell me how residents can get involved. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me, Lena. Appreciate it. Yes. So, um, as the Executive Director, what would you say your primary responsibilities are? They're kind of in a myriad angles. Mm -hmm. Most important is to the community, as you said, to expand their uh, options and interest in the cultural life. Uh, then we've got our um, artists to encourage them, to give them places where they can uh, be active, and our children to foster their interests. So between those three and then keeping the operation going and keeping the funding coming in and seeing all these wonderful ideas that everybody has and seeing what we can make real, that's part of the work. And so you mentioned options. So what exactly, what classes and and workshops are available? Arts education is just one of our pro programs, but it's one of the really central one. We take artists into the schools, but then on our own facility on Campbellton across from the high school, mm -hmm. for some who might not be aware, it's that big white house that you've always wondered what's in there. <laughs> Welcome, come on in. Nine to five, Monday through Friday, we're open and free. Um, one of our purposes there is to teach and we have a rotating group of artists who, who teach three semesters a year, visual and performing arts and uh, all ages, and it goes from glass making to sometimes pottery to mm -hmm. African drumming to um, drawing, uh, violin, viola. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a variety and it goes from all ages. Mm -hmm. uh, current semester in the summer I looked at it tend to skew more for the 16 to adult because okay. people think we're you know kids in art it's for everybody to enjoy and participate in the times run weeknights to weekends they run from four six eight sessions to just a workshop so if you've only got one afternoon and you're interested we might have a workshop for you Mm -hmm. And so how do you distinguish wh which age for this particular class? Um, a lot of it's the teacher. Okay. Mm -hmm. If they are interested and able of working with kids or they want to only work with adults or mm -hmm. paint and sip is going to be only for adults. <laughs> so <Yes. laughs> it kind of factors like that. Yes. And so, um, so what about just for the, the children for summer break? I know you have a summer camp coming up. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Our spring break and summer art camp I think are really special and that's not just the corporate entity speaking, I yes. really do. Because what we do is we take five artists who meet together with the counselors and come up with a theme. Mm -hmm. And all of their work the entire week rotates around the theme. And the way they take these themes and work them is it blows my mind. My favorite one was uh, the superhero within you. Okay, so I thought we are going to see a lot of pictures of capes and superheroes. Yes. They discuss super fruits mm. and the nutritional value. Mm. They talked about the attributes of superheroes that might be empathy, mm -hmm. might be listening, as well as flying, mm -hmm. but you know. <laughs> yes, they went deeper. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then they talked about who are the superheroes in your midst that you might not have yet, these are kids who are seven mm -hmm. years old, mm -hmm. who you might not have realized yet, like the policeman, the fireman. Yes. And then the, they did a dance to that theme, they painted to that, those themes. Mm -hmm. It was just an amazing event. And this coming July, or June, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, in a June 19th through 23, the theme is um, what's behind the mask. Mm -hmm. So we'll see yes. what they come up with with that. Yes. Yeah. And the, I should mention spring break we work with the county at Deer Lick mm -hmm. and summer art camp we work with the city at Hunter Park so that's where it'll be this year. Okay and how will they be able to register? Give us a call at 770-949-2787. Mm -hmm. Go through our website at artsdouglas.org. Um, Stop by and visit us at the 
Arts Council of Campbellton. Okay. And you don't have to be a member of the oh, council no. to participate in, right? Once you see what we do, we right. then hope you become hope a member and it yeah. is a little bit cheaper, but mm -hmm. no, this is open. Okay, yeah, perfect. And so what would you say is underneath your mask? Oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lots of coffee. Yes. <laughs> I think that's all of us, right? <laughs> it's an interesting question mm -hmm. because I've often thought that those of us in the arts don't really express what it is about the arts that make it so important in the community. We know it, mm -hmm. but how do we express it? Mm -hmm. And I went through a kind of a study of that for myself just to analyze it. Mm -hmm. And I came up with three words that were why the arts are important to me. Because to me, they define obviously creation, mm -hmm. freedom, individuality. You don't yes. get more American than that. Yes. Yes. I cannot express my individuality without my art. And if that means turning a garden faucet into a pin, I'll do it. Yes. It, it, it's how you express your art and how you express yourself, how you choose to dress, what art you put on your walls that makes you unique and an individual, and those are artistic choices. So that's what's behind my mask. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome, yes. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that um, um, other than just regular art classes, you are all doing um, yoga and media arts. Yep. I saw that as well. Yeah, And yoga is movement, so mm -hmm. we're doing the, the yoga class out in our side garden or this week on our porch yes. when it was pouring down right. rain. <laughs> And uh, the yoga, and we have African drummers, mm -hmm. and the Sabi Sobhan has been at our arts camp quite often, so he's teaching that. Uh, we have had, let's see, what was it, uh, dulcimer, okay. um, voice, piano, it depends on mm -hmm. who we recruit as teachers each semester. Okay, awesome. Yes, yeah. so it seems like you have a lot of options yes, for the do. residents of Douglas County to enjoy everything. I right there so. in one stop. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so, where can they find um, this information on your website? Mm -hmm. yes. At the website again, uh, artsdouglas.org. Mm -hmm. Stop by and visit us. Um, we have a Facebook page. Check us out there, um, or call us seven seven zero nine four nine two seven eight seven. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming in. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes. Wes and I will be back in a moment with more news, so please stay with us. I'm Lena Hardy, and this is 8700 on DCTV 23. Welcome back. It's June. That means warm to hot temperatures. For many responsible pet owners, their dog is an important member of the family, so it's natural to want to take your four-legged friend with you in the car. There's nothing wrong with bringing your dog along for a car ride as long as you have no plans to make any stops where you have to leave him in the car. It doesn't take long for a car to heat up in summer temperatures. Heat and humidity affect our furry friends the same way it does us. Humidity accompanied by 90 degree or higher temperatures make us feel miserable. The hotter the temperature is inside the vehicle, the harder it is for a dog or any pet to stay cool when hot air is the only thing they have to breathe. This puts them at a high risk of heat stroke. When the outside temperature is 70 degrees, a car can heat up to 89 degrees in just 10 minutes and 104 in 30 minutes. At 80 degrees outside, a vehicle can reach 99 degrees inside in 10 minutes. You yourself wouldn't want to stay in a vehicle and endure any of these temperatures for very long. Yet every year we read about pet owners who leave their dog alone in a vehicle while shopping, dining out, going to the movies, or doing other things. Keeping the windows cracked doesn't help. Keep in mind, too, that your dog is wearing a fur coat. It's best to leave your pet at home where you know he's safe. Since we are talking weather, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has issued its hurricane forecast for this summer. The hurricane season, which runs from June 1st through November 30th, forecasters predict a 75% chance of a normal or above normal season. They predict a likelihood of 11 to 17 named storms, of which five to nine could become hurricanes, including two to four major hurricanes. 
The effect of hurricanes on Douglas County usually is in the form of heavy rains on the outer bands of the hurricane. However, Douglas County has been hit by hurricanes, most notably Opal in September 1995 and Katrina in 2005. It's dry now, but please be weather aware. Even though we've had recent rains, Douglas County remains in a level two drought designation by the Georgia Department of Natural Resources Environmental Protection Division. We'll get the lowdown on what that means to you and your daily activities next up on Issues and Answers. So please stay with us. I'm Wes Tallon. And I'm Lena Hardy, and this is 8700 on DC TV 23. January was wet, February and March were dry, April and May were wet. We've had over 26 inches of rain so far this year. Sound good? Not so fast. We continue to be in a level two drought designation in Lindsay Sargent, communications director for the Douglasville, Douglas County Water and Sewer Authority, is here to explain what this means. Lindsay, thanks for coming across the street. I appreciate you having me over today to uh, talk about drought and dispel some of the myths and rumors uh, surrounding it and what yeah. it what it is and what it isn't. Myths so. and rumors? <laughs> you think so? Okay, with all the rain that we've had lately, and I mean, we've had a bunch of it. Mm -hmm. Why are we still in a level two drought? Um, so when you look at the state of Georgia, there's still nine counties that are in a level two drought. Um, all of these counties are in the metro Atlanta area and they all kind of uh, follow the Chattahoochee Lake Lanier corridor. So we're still in a level two drought because even though we've had good rain this beginning part of the year, um, the drought has a lot of puzzle pieces to it. It's not just based on rainfall. Okay. So when you're looking at 2017, so from January of 2017 to right now at the beginning of June, we've actually had a really good amount of rainfall and we actually have a, a small surplus of rainfall, which means we've gotten more than the average amount. And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. So when you're driving over our reservoir and you see it's full and it's, you know, we've got all this beautiful abundant water out there and you're wondering, well, what in the world are we still in the drought for? You have to look at all these bigger picture items that really spell out um, why we're still in a drought. So it's not just the rainfall. So we've had good rainfall for the beginning of this year. But when you look at a, a one year view, so from this point last year. Here to now. Correct. Okay. Um, we're still in a deficit from that period. We're still down about 12 inches for that year snapshot. Um, and we're getting ready to go into the drier summer months. Correct. We're, um, if you also look at the snapshot of temperature over the past year, it's been very warm. Um, we had a really warm winter, which led into an early spring this year. So in February, we had stuff blooming, everything was popping up, and that's very unusual for that time period. So you're looking at this temperature that's been up for a year. You're looking at rainfall that while we have a good amount right now, it has been down for the whole um, calendar year. And those are just two of the pieces. We also check our stream flows, which measure how much uh, water we have coming from streams into our reservoir. We check our ground level um, amounts. We check um, how healthy the reservoir is, which at this point is very healthy. Um, so there's a bunch of pieces that go into determining drought and what it is. And you can't look at one piece individually. You have to look at everything as a whole to determine whether you need to stay in a drought designation or not. Okay. so. We've kind of oversimplified it by just talking about rainfall totals on mm -hmm. that. Now, I know when I dr drive across down Highway 5 and go across the Dog River, it always looks dry. Mm -hmm. So you're just saying stream monitoring. This is obviously one of the things that, that you look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you mentioned groundwater. Is our groundwater down? Has this rain not? Our stream flow and our groundwaters are, are down some. They're just not as healthy and as robust as we would like to see going into the warmest part of the year. Um, we look at these and, and measure them and keep an eye on them and, and how healthy they are gives an indication of how much water we can expect to receive and keep receiving. So we are down on those fronts too, which definitely lends itself to why we're still in this drought designation. Okay. so. We've gotten the drought designation. This is done by the Georgia Department of Natural Resources Environmental mm -hmm. Protection Division. They're the big daddies at the state who yes. say, you know, <laughs> you're in level one, you're in level two, whatever. Mm -hmm. So the metro area, basically the Chattahoochee Basin, as you said, mm -hmm. is in a level two drought. 
okay, what does that mean? I mean, okay, we got a level two drought. Okay, <laughs> let's go on down the road and get a coat, go through, drive through at McDonald's. What, you know, does it affect our daily lives? So the drought designations, there are three levels, level one, level two, and level three, whereas level one is your, your smallest level and level three is your highest, most restrictive level. So we're right here in the middle between these two. Um, so level two drought does have some impact on your daily lives, but it's not, it's not going to hinder you from um, really going out and living life to the fullest. You know, okay. you're still going to be able to do all the things that you want to do for the summer. Um, but there are a couple restrictions on outdoor water usage. Um, and that's just what the level two drought is, just asking people to adhere to these restrictions be conscious that we're in a drought and just be conscious about conserving water at this time. Okay, outdoor watering, what, what's the restriction? Um, so the best thing I can do is to tell you guys to go on our website, which is www.ddcwsa.com, because all the restrictions are listed on the website. Okay. So it's a really handy little tool to go on there and check them out. Um, but just a quick overview, there's an odd even watering schedule, two days a week. So you have two days each week to water. Um, okay, so that's your, if you have an odd number street address or an even number street address, you water your flowers, bushes, trees, grass. Correct. On those, on, on designated, those designated days. On those designated days. From or certain hours? Yes. From midnight to 10 a.m. and then from 4 p.m. to midnight. So you're not going to be able to water during that midpoint of the day, but okay. that's a good point. That's a good point for you to not water during that part of the day because it evaporates it's going to anyway. evaporate anyways. It's not going to do you any good for your lawn. You need to water in the morning or in the evening when it's cooler out and that water's really going to absorb before it has time to just go up and evaporate and not really soak into the plants that need it. So, Okay, what <laughs> other restrictions are there other than outdoor um, watering? There's a few other um, pretty easy restrictions. Um, no ornamental fountains or waterfalls. So if you've got a bird bath that circulates in your yard and you have to top it up with the hose all the time, that's cut out until the level two restriction is lifted. Um, no charity car washes, which we know we're in that season where everybody's having mm. charity car washes and fundraisers, and um, we have to cut those out until we're out of the level two okay, drought. Okay, so we're talking about churches and schools churches and, and schools youth groups and, and, yeah, and that unfortunately, kind of stuff that's cannot hold car washes. Correct. What about washing your own car in your driveway? Uh, washing your car in your driveway, as well as doing any pressure washing, driveway cleaning, um, gutter washing by yourself is restricted. Now the caveat to that is you can take your car to a commercial car wash and wash it there. You can hire a commercial pressure washer to come out and pressure wash your house. Um, because those are businesses that have to stay in business they're, they're, and they have to recycle their water to a certain yeah, extent. Yeah, it's a twofold thing. A, we don't want to impact business to the point that people are losing their livelihood. And B, these are professionals that are performing these services, so we are trusting that they're using the best practices to recycle water and to conserve water. So while, uh, you know, you might wash your truck at home and use 100 gallons of water, you could take it to a commercial car wash down the street that recycles, they're going to use a small percentage of that water and that water is going to be recycled. So you still have the option of doing it, you just have to make sure that you're going to someone to, that's okay. licensed to do it. Okay enforcement is there the water police out there <laughs> the water police can be out there can be out there um, okay. at this point so uh, we do have enforcement ability we, there are certain levels of enforcement that we can put on people um, at this point we are just in the neighborhoods and in the community and enforcement is really education so we see someone that's watering outside of prescribed water times somebody that's you know, having a charity car wash or, you know, our job at this point is to talk with them, say, hey, look, we're really sorry, but you can't do this and this is why. Um, so after, after the educational component, if we continue to see people um, violating the watering restrictions and it's the same people over and over again, then we do have the option to do um, fines. And if the fines don't work, we do have the option to cut your water off. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, not a, not the perfect system, but you know, but it's, a, it's a, an important It's an important thing. Piece. We're in a level two drought. Exactly. We all need to conserve yeah. and take care of ourselves and our neighbors. Exactly. All that. <laughs> Lindsay, thanks for the information. Thank for you. Sure.
Wayne and I will be back in a moment with more news, so please stay right here. I'm Wes Talon, and this is 8700 on DCTV 23. Welcome back. The Douglas County School Nutrition Program provides nutritious meals to children who may not otherwise have access to such meals. School Nutrition serves summer meals at designated locations throughout the county. Breakfast meals includes an entree 100% fruit juice and low-fat milk, and lunch includes a choice of an entree, vegetable, fresh fruit, and low-fat milk. Any child under the age of 18, regardless of income status or enrollment in school, may eat breakfast and lunch at no cost. Adults are also welcome to eat, but will be charged $1.65 for breakfast and $3.50 for lunch. There are nine schools throughout the county that are offering this program. Douglas County High School, Lithia Springs High School, Arbor Station Elementary, Burnett Elementary, Beulah Elementary, Factory Shoals Elementary, Chapel Hill Middle School, Turner Middle School, and Bill Arp Elementary. Please check out the different schools for dates and times. Remember, there is no cost for any child 18 and younger for breakfast and lunch, and they do not have to attend any Douglas County school. Speaking of schools, congratulations are in store for Eastside Elementary for recently being named one of 92 schools in the nation with an outstanding music education program. Eastside received the Support Music Merit Award from the National Association of Music Merchants Foundation. The award is based on survey results and recognizes outstanding efforts to ensure access to music learning for all students as part of a well-rounded education. You'll be able to hear East Science Chorus perform at the 15th Annual September Saturdays Festival at the Douglas County Courthouse. The festival will be held Saturday, September 23rd and 30th, and vendor registration is now open at SeptemberSaturdays.com. Register to be a vendor in the community marketplace and reach about 30,000 of your friends and neighbors over the two Saturdays in a fun and celebratory atmosphere. It's all about community. And that's the news for now from 8700. Thanks for joining us. I'm Wes Talon. And I'm Lena Hardy. See you next time.